In this film, I will examine Starbucks and the commodity of coffee. When taking a look at coffee, I will cover history, trade agreements, tariffs, economics, and fair trade. Coffee. Originating from Ethiopia, 850 AD, from a goat herder named Keldi. Keldi found his goats eating the red fruit from a tree. After trying it himself, he found a heightened sense of energy, and thus, coffee was born. With over 400 billion cups of coffee consumed yearly, contributing 75% of America's caffeine intake, and being the second most traded commodity in the world, next to crude oil, coffee has risen to a stature of necessity. But it affects so much in the world with more than its caffeine content. Political, economic, social, dependency, physically, psychologically. Brazil. A good example of a country affected by coffee. The first coffee bush was planted in Suriname. In Suriname, the Dutch still possessed descendants of the Amsterdam tree, but kept them closely guarded. However, French Guiana obtained seeds from a felon who had escaped into Suriname and stole some seeds. In exchange for his seeds, the authorities in French Guiana agreed to give him freedom and repatriated him. The initial furtive attempts to get viable seeds or seedlings into Brazil failed. Suriname and French Guiana became involved in a border dispute and asked Brazil to provide an arbitrator. Brazil dispatched Francisco de Melo Paleta, an army officer, instructing him to settle the dispute and bring home some coffee plants. The hearings were successful. As a gesture of appreciation for this guest of honor, the governor's wife presented Paleta with a beautiful bouquet. Hidden among the flowers, however, were fertile coffee seeds. It's been rumored that Francisco used personal attraction and scandalous affair to acquire the bouquet. It could be said that in 1727, Brazil's now billion-dollar coffee industry was born from lust, scandal, and a single bouquet. Although famous for their tea drinking, Britain was the first European nation to embrace the pleasures of coffee drinking on a commercial basis. The need for coffee was urgent. Regularly, alcohol was the morning drink, and a replacement that wouldn't intoxicate the working man was a must. The first coffee house was in Oxford in 1650, where a Turkish Jew named Jacob opened it in a building now known as the Grand Café. More opened soon after in London in 1652, where there were soon to be hundreds. It's in these coffee houses that the concept of tipping was introduced. Tip, or to ensure promptness, was originally a metal coffee cup on the front desk, where customers would drop money to get a better table, service, or coffee. Coffee is grown in nearly 80 countries around the planet. Now since the coffee plant needs lots of rain and warm temperatures year-round, it is only grown in tropical regions near the equator. In 1971, three men, Gordon Balker, Zev Segal, and Jerry Baldwin, founded a small Seattle coffee shop in the Pikes Place market you may now recognize, Starbucks. The three partners all enjoyed fine coffees, exotic teas, and believed they could make it big in Seattle with their idea and concept. Each invested $1,350 and borrowed another $5,000 from the bank to open the Pikes Place store. Balker, Seagal, and Baldwin chose the name Starbucks in honor of Starbucks, the coffee drinking first mate in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. It wasn't until 1982 that Howard Schultz, a big time New York businessman, caught interest. Schultz started working from the bottom and worked his way up, making subtle suggestions and pitching ideas. It wasn't until 1983 that Schultz visited Italy, but more importantly, Italian coffee houses. Howard was entranced by the personal charm and romance that coffee houses provided, with friendly service, clever hand-prepared drinks, and overall atmosphere that the coffee shops possessed. Schultz convinces the founders of Starbucks to test the coffee house concept in downtown Seattle, where the first Starbucks cafe latte is served. This successful experiment is the start for the Starbucks company you know today. With 16,700 plus locations, an average annual income of 10 billion, there is no doubt that you have either tried or been affected by Starbucks, as has the entire coffee industry. At Starbucks, we've been sourcing our coffee in an ethical way for many, many years. We work with farmers to ensure that they get a fair price, that they're farming in the way that's responsible to the environment, and that we take care of the communities in which we do business. Fair trade means that coffee farmers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America get a fair price for their crop, and a premium on top that enables them to invest in building a better tomorrow for their communities and their children. 
With our move in the UK and Ireland to 100% fair trade espresso, what that means is that every latte, every cappuccino, every Americano that our customers buy will be 100% fair trade. In 2008, we made a commitment to double our purchase of fair trade coffee, and Starbucks is now the largest purchaser of fair trade coffee in the world. And with this move, building on a decade of partnership with fair trade, Starbucks is really using its scale for good. For every pound of fair trade coffee we buy, there's a 10 cent premium that goes directly to the coffee farmers in their community for them to decide how they want to spend it best. Who have, for example, in Costa Rica, invested the fair trade premium in enabling children to go to secondary school for the first time and in meeting their health care needs. I think customers want to know that the companies from which they purchase behave in an ethical and responsible way. That not only are they having the perfect beverage, but they're also helping the communities from which we buy our coffee. Okay, let's talk economics. Coffee farmers are paid when people buy their coffee. But what determines how much they're paid? Let's look at the price of coffee. Now when we say the price of coffee, we're not talking about how much you pay for coffee at a store. We're talking about how much farmers get paid for their coffee crop. So the average price of coffee over the last hundred years has been something like two dollars a pound. But if we look at the actual prices from year to year, we see something pretty weird. The price is extremely unstable. There are many ways that coffee farmers try to improve their livelihood like protecting themselves from the market's unstable prices or reducing the environmental impacts of coffee farming. One way they can do this is by joining a cooperative, or co-op for short. The co-op here in San Marcos is called Coope Tarasu. So what is a co-op? Well, it is basically a group where the members are also the owners. Coope Tarasu is made up of about 2,500 members who are all coffee farmers in the region. Members promise to sell all their coffee to the co-op and follow the co-op's standards. The co-op then processes and sells the beans. The co-op sets its own prices. It shields farmers from the risky coffee market and acts like a financial safety net when world prices fall or are unstable. In addition, the co-op offers services to the farmers, like education about the coffee market, advice about farming practices, access to new supplies, and even loans. So maybe you'd imagine that all we have to do is get coffee from the farmer, ship it to the United States, get it to a roaster, and then the coffee drinker. But what actually happens in real life is something more like this. Really? Okay, so after the farmers, we got companies who are in charge of exporting coffee. And then there are also governments that control coffee exports. Once we are in the United States, then we've got importing companies. We've got traders who arrange sales. And sometimes coffee gets traded multiple times. Then it goes to the roaster. After it gets roasted, it can go to a distributor, and that sells it to a grocery store, or maybe a restaurant, and then you can buy it. With every extra step, more and more cost is added to the coffee beans for profit. That is complicated. Now if that wasn't enough, check this out. There's this thing called futures trading. In futures trading, the price for something is decided before it even exists. It's like deciding on Tuesday how much coffee will cost on Friday. People like doing this because it is a more secure way to buy something. But everything is based on speculation by traders in New York who assess things like the economy and politics, the weather, or other stuff that might affect coffee supply. In this kind of situation, prices are decided by business people who are basically trying to predict the future. So if you think about it, mere rumors could be enough to totally change coffee prices, regardless of what is actually happening on the coffee farms. So how much of this kind of stuff is going on? Well, believe it or not, today, futures trading makes up the majority of all coffee trading activity. Out of every dollar that you spend on coffee, it's estimated that only about four cents goes to the coffee farmer. When looking at traditional trade, winners are coffee traders, retail sellers, coffee roasters, and Wall Street. The losers are coffee farmers and migrant workers. When looking at fair trade, the winners are coffee farmers, migrant workers, and co-ops. The losers, retail sellers, coffee traders, and Wall Street. Currently, there are no tariffs in place by the EU or the U.S. The ICO seeks to regulate by stabilizing price and setting quotas for trade.